I didn't set my clocks to the appropriate time. Usually my dog coughs in the morning and she didn't know that the time changed so she didn't cough on time. <laughs> so I'm still recovering from that. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, please continue to pray for Pastor Dave and Carissa uh, as they are in the company of family and friends during this difficult time of the passing of his father. And how many know that we have great leadership and pastoral care with Pastor Dave and Carissa uh, that they give here? <laughs> Amen. That they provide here at Family Worship Center, but not only to Family Worship Center, but also to the community and, and other churches and pastors. And pastor is uh, a pastor amongst pastors. And uh, just as they prayed and comforted us when we've gone through our challenges and losses, uh, we also need to do the same for them. Amen. So let's continue to pray for them. But please turn your Bibles or your phones to John chapter 14, verse 1. We are in a new series. Uh, Pastor Dave started a few weeks ago on the final instructions from Jesus to his disciples before he was arrested and crucified. And we are basically looking at the last six hours Jesus spent with his disciples. And it starts in John chapter 13 and it goes through John chapter 17, a, t a total of five chapters. And it is without doubt that the final instructions or the last words of Jesus, especially prior to his death, have extreme significance in Christianity and history as we see it today. And as we read through these scriptures and passages, we discover um, that Jesus is pouring out his heart and he's giving us his pure honesty of what he's really truly thinking and feeling prior to his death. And speaking of last words and final instructions of Jesus, have you ever thought about what your last words or instructions will be when you die? Now, it's a loaded question. It's a tough question to answer, especially at this moment. But when you really start thinking about it, questions pass through our minds such as, what would I want to talk about? And who would I want to talk to during my final moments here on earth? You see, people lean in a little closer and pay attention to the last words of anyone that's passing. And a couple of reasons why this happens is because words can summarize someone's life. It can give insight into someone's values or guiding beliefs. And here, here are some words, some last words, some famous words that people have said while they passed. Do you guys remember Todd Beamer when he said this, are you guys ready? Let's roll. You guys remember that statement? This was said by Todd Beamer, who along with several others attempted to regain control of United Airlines Flight 93, which was hijacked and crashed as part of the 9-11 attacks. And these last words gripped the heart of the nation and encapsulated the American spirit to, to never give up. Let's take a look at these last famous words by this guy sketched up last night. And the irony behind it, he said, tomorrow I shall no longer be here. This was said by Nostradamus, in which he died the very next morning. You guys remember Bob Hope? If you raise your hand, it will reveal how old you really are. But Bob Hope was a great comedian back in the days, and his wife, Dolores, asked him where he wanted to be buried, and his last words were, surprise me. <laughs> Here are some last words from a husband to his wife. His very last words, and he, they could not find his body after he said this, and he said, you're right, babe, you do look fat in that dress. <laughs> do you guys want to know who this guy is? I'm a kidding. His name is I'm a kidding. Now, when I'm thinking about my last words would be, I would want them to be something that rhymes, something that you can make a song out of, that you can etch on a coffee cup, sew on a pillow. But when reality settles in, and if I'm really honest with you guys and myself, my last words would probably be this. Hey, bro, watch this. You see, Jesus knew that not only were his instructions important prior to his death, but also who to say them to. And this leads us into John chapter 14, verse 1. And it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. 
You know the place, you know the place, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. That will be sufficient enough to calm our fears. And Jesus answered and said, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Verse 11 says, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the work themselves. And let's, let's pause here for a brief moment. And if we can say these words in unison together, do not let your hearts be troubled. Look at your neighbor to the right and say, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now look at your other neighbor and say, you're in trouble. <laughs> I believe what precedes John chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled is just as important as what follows it. When reading these statements from Jesus, two questions come to my mind. Number one, why are their hearts troubled? What are they so fearful and worried about that Jesus has to address and give attention to? And number two, what is Jesus going to say that will bring peace to their troubled hearts? Question one, why are the hearts troubled? Why did the disciples fear? I mean, things were going great during the beginning of Jesus' last week of ministry. Heck, even before the last week of Jesus' ministry, Jesus had already done many miracles, many miracles. He changed water into wine, healed a man with leprosy, healed a paralyzed man, healed a centurion servant, raised a widow's son from the dead, calmed the storms, casted out demons, fed the 5,000, walked on water, healed the blind, raised his best friend Lazarus from the dead, and did so much more. The evidence of his works spoke for themselves. And you see, the disciples were not unfamiliar with the accomplishments and miracles of Jesus. So when Monday rolled around the last week of Jesus' ministry, it started out very predictable like every other week did, right? Which was very eventful. On Monday, Jesus had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. People were shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord while waving palm branches. I mean, what a great way to start a Monday, right? Can you imagine coming into work with that type of excitement and enthusiasm? I mean, most of us in real life are lucky to get a nod, let alone a cup of coffee or a good morning. Tuesday came. Jesus cursed a tree with his words and it withered away and cleansed the temple. And on Wednesday, Jesus gives his Olivet Discourse where he talked about the end times while resting with his disciples. But Thursday came around, and that's when all hell broke loose. It was a turning point from good news and good things to bad news and bad things, from victories to defeat, from abundance and miracles to death and sorrow. But what happened that changed the mood and direction of how things were going? And this is where John chapter 13 sheds light on what happened. I know Pastor covered this already, but just as a refresher, they were having a celebratory supper. And they didn't know that it was the Last Supper, but Jesus suddenly changes gears and talks about going away. That he would die, that one of his disciples was a traitor, and that that disciple who was a traitor was going to betray him. Peter was going to disown him three times in front of his face. Satan was at work against all of them, and all the disciples would fall away. Now, this sounds like a scene from Godfather, amen? Anybody seen Godfather? I did, and I'd heard about it. I was in church when that happened, but. <laughs> Hence, the weight of these revelations must have been greatly depressing to hear, and it created a fear to the point that their hearts were shaken. They were very troubled. And think about it for a second. 
They left all, the disciples left all they had to follow Jesus. They spent three years of their life with Jesus, and he's suddenly going to leave them to go die. And again, as you can imagine, they are fearful and worried about the future. And please keep in mind that Jesus is also troubled as he is living in the shadow of the cross. And he is fully, fully aware that he will be arrested, butchered, humiliated, wrongly accused, and crucified within 24 hours for the sins of the whole world. Yet Jesus, as a caring Messiah, suppresses his troubled heart, his mental and physical exhaustion and suffering for the sake of his disciples. And he gently leans in and he tells them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now when Jesus said these words, I can only imagine what their faces look like. I mean, he just created this Debbie Downer death list and is telling his disciples to not worry about it. In fact, if I was there and if I was one of those disciples, this would be <laughs> my expression if Jesus told me, do not let your hearts be troubled after he just said all these bad things, this kind of would summarize what I would feel and think in my mind. It would be the same facial reaction as Nacho Libre's cheesy, half-hearted, thin mustache smile that shows little about how I, how I truly think and feel inside. I would make a guess and say that most of us who have gone through or are going through things or bouts of fear have probably given this type of facial reaction as well, right? When people say, it's going to be okay, don't be afraid, keep your head up, are you okay? I heard you just fell off a 10-story building and now you're in a full body cast, but how are you doing? <laughs> and you're like, bro, you don't even know what I'm feeling, thinking, or going through. Why would you even ask or tell me that it's going to be okay when reality says otherwise? Is there anybody in this room that could agree with this facial expression besides me? Now, in regards to do not let your hearts be troubled, why is that significant, you might ask? Why does that even matter to elaborate on and to talk about? It matters and is significant because it shows that Jesus gave attention to what the disciples feared. Let me say it this way. Jesus gave his undivided attention to his disciples' fear during the last six hours of his death, or prior to his death. His last instructions, his last words addressed fear. Listen, Jesus cares about what you fear. Very elementary thought, but very profound to really think about that the Son of God, the maker of heaven and earth, cares about what you fear. In spite of all the global chaos that is much alive today as it was back then, he still remains faithfully and fully aware of what you feel and what you fear, what you worry about, what keeps you up at night. Seven billion plus people in the world with many different types of fear, and yet he not only has the capacity but also the capability to fully give his undivided attention to what you actually care about. Not too long ago, our house was broken into, and they stole a few things from our garage. The good news is that what they stole was broken already, so it was a, it was a good help for us. My wife had left the door unlocked, and uh, that's a different subject that's been addressed at marriage counseling, but <laughs> not sure if anyone else has had this happen to you, but it gets your blood boiling, right? It gets you livid. And that night, my kids were obviously scared and very fearful, and my little girl, Kenzie, stood a little closer to me as than, you know, than she usually does. And as his dad, I started to provide assurance. I started to make promises that everything is going to be okay. I mean, I answered like 500 questions that were all hypothetical. Questions like, what happens if he or she blows the door open? What happens if a bad person gasses us while we're sleeping? <laughs> My son was like, what happens if he opens the door? To which I said, well, he can't because the doors are locked. Well, what about the windows? Well, the windows are shut. They're locked. And he was giving me all these hypotheticals, which finally led him to ask, well, what happens if a bad person gets an army tank and blows up the house? And this was my reaction. Oh, come on. 
never mind. You know what I'm saying. The Nacho Libre uh, face. But each time I assured them that they are safe and I made diehard promises that they would be okay. I did surveillance checks. I made sure everything was locked and loaded, if you know what I mean. Doors were locked. My motion alert on my security camera was all the way up. Their fear became my priority. And I simply brought comfort to their troubled hearts. Likewise, Christ showed attention to what the disciples feared. Their fear became his priority. And he didn't overlook it. Listen, he didn't overlook it. He wasn't dismissive about it. He wasn't threatened by it. And he certainly didn't feel incapable about addressing it. He could have said, you know, do you guys know what I'm about to go through? Do you guys know what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking? Let alone about your silly little fears. He addressed it. And Paul perfectly expounds upon this. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, I love this, the Father of all compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us not in some troubles but in what? All troubles. Peter affirmed this as well when he wrote 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I have a question for you. What fear do you have that needs the attention of Jesus? Let me say it differently. Whatever you fear, you already have the attention of Jesus. Now we know that there are many different types of fears also known as phobias in this world. And depending on which fear you have, you respond to it, right? By either fight, flight, or you just cry. You either run, escape the situation, or defend and protect yourself and others. I remember there, I was running, and, uh, and it was late at night, and there was these two dogs, and they approached me, and, and they always say, you know, as a runner, you just, uh, you just ignore them. And that, whoever said that is a liar, because no dogs ever follow them. And I did that at first, and that dog, those dogs approached me, and I didn't have anything to defend myself, so all I had was my voice. And I, I was, ha, he, ha, you know, all these weird noises, and it didn't do nothing, and uh, I just had to run a lot faster. But we respond to fear differently. But regardless, we respond to it. And here are some list of phobias that people might have. Arachnophobia, spiders, anybody have a fear of that? Yeah? I remember I was in this, in a, uh, on an island in Australia and for missionary work, and uh, they put us downstairs in the basement, and there's like no windows, no doors, uh, so you can only imagine what lives in there along with what we were sleeping with, and I can hear just at night, just... So ever since then, spiders are just, uh, just not good. There's the fear of snakes, the fear of heights, the fear of flying, the fear of injections, needles, and then there's social pho uh, phobias, which involves the fear of social situations like standing in front of a large crowd and teaching while people stare at you and ask themselves, when is Pastor Dave coming back? That's a, that's a fear. <laughs> but there is an unhealthy fear that gripped the hearts of the disciples, which got the attention of Jesus. And when I speak of fear, I'm speaking about the unhealthy version of fear, the fear that leads to unbelief. You see, unhealthy fear is the fear that leads to unbelief. And this is the fear that, but, that the Bible speaks about. It tries to undo what God already did, is doing, and will do. What God already promised and accomplished. As you read throughout the Bible of the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Bible combats unhealthy fear frequently amongst God's people. And if we had to put a name or title on this particular fear that the disciples were experiencing, it would be this. Chronophobia, which is... Defined as the persistent and often irrational fear of the future or the fear of passing time. And to sum it up, chronophobia is the fear about the outcomes of tomorrow that we have no control over. You see, the disciples, again, gave up everything they had, including their reputation. And now Jesus is not only going to leave them, but he's going to die. And again, I can only imagine what they're thinking. What are we going to do? Will we have food? Who's going to provide? Who's going to hire us? Who's going to accept us? 
How are we going to pay for things? How am I going to provide and protect my family? Anybody repeat these fears? You see, fear does the following. Unhealthy fear does the following. It, fear breeds more fear. It's a spider web effect, right? You lose some hours at work, and it leads to you being stranded on the street naked with nothing. Fear erases yesterday's victories. And think about that. The disciples saw everything. Lazarus being raised from the dead. The feeding of 5,000 people. Fear makes you miss the obvious. Fear negatively impacts us mentally and physically. It's physically and mentally exhausting to be fearful. Fear muddies clear thinking, which leads to indecisiveness, crazy cycle. And fear can lead to abusive controlling, which leads to isolation. And there are many other negative consequences. So while the disciples are obviously troubled by what they just heard from Jesus, again, Jesus quiets their heart, says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And this leads to my second question. What is Jesus going to say that will bring peace to their fears? And before we jump into this, I'm a firm believer that it's not in, in the truth that it doesn't matter what happens to you that makes you who you are. It's how you respond to what happens to you that makes you who you are. You see, when we are fearful, we respond according to what we think is best for us, right? If you're in an airplane and that airplane experiences turbulence, what do you do? You grip something, right? You hold on something. You cut the circulation off someone's blood system, right? And likewise, when you fear about the future, what do you grab onto? What do you hold onto? And this is where Jesus leads us to three truths and promises to think about, to grip onto, and to put into our sacred system of beliefs when we react to the fear of the future in which we have no control over. Number one, when, Jesus, when facing our fears, we should think Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 1 says, Trust God, trust also in me. What does Jesus have that fear doesn't? Why should I turn my attention to Jesus? Why should I direct the traffic of fear to the feet of Jesus? Well, for us to lay hold of this truth that will in turn help us think Jesus, we should get to know what Jesus is about a little bit. And Paul writes beautifully about this in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. He says this about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for not 60% of the time, all the time, for all, right? For all the fullness to dwell in him. Trust God, trust also in me. Jesus has it together. Let me elaborate on this a little by going to a story found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4 which tells a story of Jesus and his disciples and how they were caught up in this furious uh, storm. And the waves during the storm began to crash against the boat so much that it started to flood the boat with the water. By the result of this, the disciples began to panic, and they noticed Jesus wasn't panicking with them. Instead, they found him in the stern of the ship, sleeping on a cushion. And they woke up Jesus and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Can you not feel the wind and the water like we feel the wind and the water? And Jesus got up like a stud that he is and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then he turns towards his disciples and said, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And this is what caught my attention. And they were exceedingly fearful and asked each other, 
Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Exceedingly fearful. They became more fearful of the power of Jesus than the power of the wind and the waves. Listen, the power of your fear will never be greater than the power of Jesus. In the late second century, Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor at the time, if you saw Gladiator, the old man who was killed by Commodus, uh, that was a Marcus, Marcus Aurelius' uh, historical figure, and he oversaw what is considered by some as the fourth major persecution of Christians in history. And this is like around 160 to 180 AD, and there was this famous Roman medical writer slash doctor named Claudius Gla uh, Galenus. And in his writings, about a half dozen times, he mentions Christians. Now, something you should know is that back in those days, it was illegal to examine a dead body. They either buried it or they burned it. No medical doctor could do autopsies. So what doctors would do is that they would hang around the arenas or places where people were dying because they can examine dying bodies and not dead bodies. So this famous medical writer who examined dying bodies examined many Christians dying because they were severely tortured by the Romans and by the thousands. And keep in mind, this is not 20 years after Jesus' resurrection. This is roughly about 160 years plus after the resurrection of Jesus. And Claudius Galenus writes this about his experience with Christians. He says the following, for fearlessness of death and the hereafter is something we witness in them every day. It was a fearlessness of the early Christians that captured the attention of the Roman Empire because they didn't fear anything, including death. The only thing they feared was a resurrected Savior. And you'll notice in Scripture, during their time with Jesus, they were always fearful. There's many occasions where Jesus had to tell them, do not be afraid. But after the resurrection of Jesus, you don't see that no more because Jesus conquered death. Jesus told his disciples as he sends them out to evangelize in Matthew chapter 28, verses uh, 28 through tw uh, 31, he says, Do not fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to, to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fail to the ground apart from your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You are more valuable than many sparrows. When you're facing your fear, think Jesus. Amen? You guys with me? Oh, man, what just happened? All right, we're going to move on. The second truth to think about and to grip onto when facing fear is to think eternally. Oh, wow, what is going on? There we go. Think eternally. My father's house, John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And what she is speaking about, heaven. Now the Bible, uh, the word heaven in the Bible appears roughly about 432 times. It, it talks about it being a real, physical, tangible place. And there are many fascinating things about heaven. One of them is that in Revelation chapter 21, if you have a chance to read it, it's, it's a marvelous city. It's 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles high. You really think about that, that's an extremely tall city, right? I mean, commercial airliners fly at an altitude of about seven to eight miles high. It's 1,500 miles high. The literal land area of the city described in Revelation in 21 would be, the size of heaven would be, square footage, 2,250,000 square miles. It's half the size, roughly half the size of the United States of America. It's a big city, and the Bible speaks about being a real place. But it's not just a real place. This is the thing that I love about it. It's our home. 
Billy Graham said, my home is in heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 through 20 says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break and steal. Store up treasures in heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, therefore we do not lose heart but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary, someone say momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Be eternally minded. While, when I was in college, I was very homesick. Now, I lived there, but that wasn't my home. It was not my home. I was not only homesick, but I was homesick and poor, which is very difficult. I didn't have two pennies, let alone two nickels, to rub together. And I couldn't afford an airline ticket, but my wonderful mom bought me a ticket from an unnamed bus company <laughs> to come home. I had to take several side streets to find out where this bus was at in someone's backyard. It was a very sketchy company. I mean, I didn't know if I was going to end up in Pittsburgh, New York, Juarez, or Colorado, but I didn't care. I really didn't care. I didn't care about the rudeness of the people. If anybody who's been on a bus, it could be for a long drive. It could be unruly. But I really didn't care about it. I really didn't care about the god-awful suffocating smell of dried urine in the seat next to me. I didn't care about the smell, the yelling. All I cared about was going home. There's a lady. Keep it together, Sai. Keep it together. I was at this nursing home, and she was probably in her upper 80s. And you know, you do your kind of cheesy, generic. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And um, just to kind of get by, she was kind of in the way, so I had to say hi to her, and I did. And, uh, but she did not let me pass her by. And um, I had to give her my attention. And I began to talk with her, and she, she knew she was, you know, death was imminent. And I mean, I didn't know what to say and how to say it, and show empathy, and you know, so I'm very socially awkward as it is. And um, I'm like, so what, what do you do here? <laughs> She's like, well, I'm in a wheelchair. Um, I don't have much strength to go around, but she says, my two goals is this, to preach the gospel, and I wanna go home. My longing to be home, and her longing to be home, outweighed what I was experiencing, and it will outweigh what she's suffering. Paul said it best, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You see, when we are eternally minded, we behave and act accordingly. Being eternally minded is to be mission minded. And we, when we think eternally, we begin to say, Lord, come. When you see all the evil atrocities in this world, you have no, to any, to little control of the outcomes of these people's lives. It's just, Lord, come. We eagerly wait for Jesus' return. And the very last words of Jesus in red in Scripture is in the book of Revelation. Our response when we see everything, suffering, affliction, we say, Lord, Come. And his response to us is, yes, I'm coming soon. Vengeance is mine, amen? The third thing we think about is the way. If you want to follow the way that leads to eternal life, it begins and sustained by Jesus. 
John chapter 3, verse 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 says it best, Therefore we, since we, have, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For what purpose? Verse three answers this, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's stand up as we close. When we grow weary and lose heart because of fear, you're gonna grip, you're gonna think about something you're going to hold on to something. Let's hold on and let's think Jesus. Let's think eternally. And let's keep our eyes on the path. What are your hearts troubled with? What outcomes of tomorrow that you have no control over are bothering you? Maybe there's fear about a job you currently have, whether they are going to let you go or they're going to keep you. Maybe you're in sales and your numbers are not to the expectations of your company. Maybe you're about to lose your house or lose your job. Maybe the doctors did some tests and you don't know the results yet. Maybe there's some fear about your marriage or fear about your child's future, fear about loneliness or making ends meet or the pandemic we're hearing on the news. Listen, whatever your fear is, you have the attention of the way maker the miracle maker, and his name is Jesus. And he's asking you, before you allow fear to take hold of your hearts, before you start struggling to survive, and I'm not saying don't plan or don't take precautions. The presence of peace doesn't mean the absence of planning. That's not what I'm saying or advocating, and that's not what Jesus is saying either. He's saying before you start missing the obvious, just like the disciples did, because of fear, before you start doing things on your own might and on your own will, he's asking you to seek the kingdom of God first. And you might ask, well, how do I do that? How do we proceed from here? Listen, think Jesus. Think eternally. And keep your eyes on the path. Nahum says in chapter 1, verse 3, I love this, his way is in the whirlwind and the storm. And clouds are the dust of his feet. Jesus cares about what you really fear about. That's so thankful. I mean, there's a lot of successes we can, you know, we try to, uh, to, to match up to, and, but Jesus cares about what you fear just as much he cares about your success and everything else about you. And he has the time, the capacity, the, the capability to not only care about it, but to meet it and direct the traffic of your fear to what he's promised and what he's done on the cross. Amen? Jesus, we thank you. God, we thank you for what you did on the cross, what you're doing in our lives, what you're gonna do, God. We don't know the outcome, God. There's a lot of uncertainty in this world, but the uncertainty that I have, God, I leave it in the hands and at your feet. But I just pray that you would quiet the storms that are moving in our mind, God, that's causing chaos and confusion, that's leading to indecisiveness, God, that's growing and growing in our hearts and our minds. I just pray that you would quiet the storms, God, and help us, God, give us the strength to think eternally, to think about you, and to keep our eyes on the path. We thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. God's peace upon your life. Pray God's joy in your life. And when your joy is unsettled, your peace is unsettled, think Jesus, think eternally, and keep your eyes on the path. Amen. God bless you. Pastor Dave will be back next week.